So the first thing I want to uh, mention, assignment two is uploaded. It's due on September 19th in class. Uh, and then on September 19th, you also have your quiz one, which covers convex functions, linear algebra, and calculus. Um, so those are the first three review lectures that we had. And uh, if you look at Carmen, uh, there is a document which contains the questions that you should be comfortable answering. Uh, and and um, in the quiz, the topics will be, so sorry, the questions will be very similar to the ones that's there in the handout online. Uh, today we want to start with uh, conjugate direction method. Okay, and in conjugate direction method, the goal is to solve this minimization problem. This is an unconstrained optimization problem. So I want to minimize a quadratic loss function. Um, Q is Q is greater than zero, and of course B is in Rn. So what's the answer to this question? What is X star here? So this is a convex function, right? Um, first order necessary condition is also sufficient. So let's try to compute what, what X star is here. Okay, so, so let's uh, differentiate Uh, f with respect to x. So I have a gradient of fx equals to qx minus b. And so this gradient of fx star will be qx star minus b should be equal to 0, which means x star equals to q inverse b. So that gives you what the value of x star should be for this. Oh, uh, no, that's a good question. So no, we are not really treating this as a second power. Uh, so. The derivative of x transpose qx is you first differentiate with respect to x, keeping this as constant. So what you get is qx, and then you keep you keep this as constant and you differentiate with respect to this, and so you again get qx. So that is two qx. Yes. Uh, can you please remind me why this is an unconstrained optimization problem? Oh, because x takes values in Rn. Okay, so the domain is not constrained. X could lie anywhere in the in the space. That's why it's an unconstrained optimization problem. Okay, so in general, f x g x is gradient of x f x multiplied by g x plus gradient of g x multiplied by fx okay so that's 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 the idea i'm using right here okay uh, i'm going to well i'll let it be on the board for some time uh, now the question is uh, you know you might ask or you might argue that if I know that this is the objective function, I know the value of q, I know the value of b, I could just uh, invert the q multiplied by b and get the x value of x star. So why do we have to come up with an algorithm for that? Okay, so can someone defend why we need an algorithm for solving this problem? Any thoughts? Why would somebody want to come up with an algorithm to solve that problem for which 
I can compute x star in closed form expression. No, Q is positive definite, so it has to be invertible. If all eigenvalues are zero, if all eigenvalues are non-zero, then the matrix is invertible. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go with the Q matrix we're dealing with. Okay, what's your? Okay, yes. Yes, so the answer is a, a combination of both the ideas. So one reason is this n could be humongous, 1 million or 100,000 or 10,000. And so inverting a matrix, which is 10,000 cross 10,000 is a very difficult problem. Uh, I mean, we know how to invert a matrix, but it's just going to take a long time. And the second reason is I don't need to know the exact solution x star. As long as I'm within some small ball around x star, uh, I'm, I'm happy, okay? I don't need to go exactly, I don't need to get exactly the value of x star. An approximation is good enough for some practical application, okay? So doing the inverse and multiplying it by b will give me the exact solution in a very long time. So I just, I'm just uh, happy with an approximately optimal solution. And so I need an algorithm which can do that as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. So what's the setting? The first thing is I need uh, directions d1 all the way up to dn that are q conjugate, what does that mean? I want di transpose q dj to be equal to 0 for all i not equal to j. Okay, so I need to come up with a set of vectors that are q conjugate. And what are q conjugate vectors? Well, they satisfy this, uh, uh, this expression. Now, you've done it in your assignment how to compute. So if I give you a generic set of vectors that are linearly independent, you have an algorithm that computes Q conjugate vectors, right? That's part of your problem two in assignment one. So you know how to compute Q conjugate vectors. So let's say you have this set of Q conjugate vectors. You have computed it. It requires, so computing Q conjugate requires simple matrix operation, so it won't, get, it won't take too much time. And in some cases, you can even do it on the fly, okay? You can get Q conjugate vectors on the fly. So let's assume that we have these Q conjugate vectors. Uh, so the algorithm is, xk plus one equals xk plus alpha k dk, okay, and x1 is pegged arbitrarily, okay, so x1 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or some random vector in n dimension. And I'm going to pick alpha k as arg min of alpha in r, so remember this alpha is not strictly greater than 0, this is alpha in r f of xk plus alpha dk. Yes? So the conjugate uh, vectors, when, and you discussed them on the homework, or it referred to the Gram-Schmidt process. Yes. And in normal linear algebra that was used for orthogonalizing yes. vectors. Yes, yes. Is Q-conjugation a generalization on top of that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So in, in, the, in the usual Gram-Schmidt process that you might have studied, Q is actually identity, okay. Okay, which is a positive definite matrix. So this is just a generalization of that idea. Okay. Okay. So I want to compute alpha K, which is argument of this particular expression. So let's do that. Uh, now remember that f is a convex function in x, 
So fact f is convex in x, so this implies f is convex in alpha. Okay, not a very hard thing to check. Now I want to solve this minimization problem and I know that this function is a convex function of alpha. So how do I solve the minimization? How do I get the value of alpha k? Any thoughts? Yeah. Right. So No, this is just f of x. Yes. 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 This f is the same as this f. So gradient with respect to alpha of f of x k plus alpha d k is d k transpose gradient of f xk plus alpha dk which is equal to dk transpose qxk plus alpha dk minus p. I'm going to expand this. So I get alpha multiplied by dk transpose q dk plus dk transpose qxk minus p. Okay, any questions so far? No questions. So what did we st what did we do? Uh, we have a gigantic optimization problem to solve. Um, so what we first did was got some Q conjugate vectors, a set of Q conjugate vectors in n dimensions, and then we want to run this algorithm alpha k, where I want to run this algorithm where alpha k is chosen according to this fashion, and then we realize that well f is actually this is convex in alpha. So I am going to differentiate, take the first order derivative, set it equal to 0 in order to get alpha star. And so my alpha star, actually, let me just write it as alpha k. So alpha k equals dk transpose b minus q xk over dk transpose q dk. Okay, so once I know dk and I know q, this is just matrix multiplication which is easy. This is just matrix multiplication and addition which is easy. So this is easy to compute. By easy I mean that it's very fast. These operations don't take much time. It's much, much faster than computing the inverse of a matrix which is very large. On the order of what for computation? I think matrix multiplication is of the order of n, not n raised to 3. So 
matrix inverse is n raised to 3 and n cube and this is n or n square okay but the constants also matter okay it's just not a matter of n cube or n square there are constants associated with it and that also matters so what we get is an algorithm right this algorithm where alpha k can be computed very quickly and I keep iterating x1, x2, x3, x4. So starting from x1, I go x2, x3, I get x2, x3, x4, all the way up to xn. And the property of this algorithm is another fact, which we will prove shortly, is that xn plus 1 is actually equal to x star. So once you run this algorithm for n times, you get, you recover the value of x star. Okay. Now, if you don't want an exact value of x star, you know the value of n, let's say n is 10,000, you can probably stop at 8,000 or 6,000 or 5,000 iteration and you get an approximately optimal value of x star. Okay, yeah. Do we have anything in, like with the Newton's method where we had a bound on how, how um, each, each step closer was uh, as, as, uh, close, closer using the two-norm on there? No, no, there is, so it depends, it depends on what are the Q conjugate vectors you take, where exactly the point lies and so on. So do we so even have uh, a guarantee that iteration will get closer? Yes, so that's the guarantee we are going to study next. Okay. So you always minimize, you always get closer and closer to x star as you iterate, but you don't know how close you are because that depends on a lot of other factors. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, if your n is 10,000, you can run it for 6,000 and then you can uh, get close to x star. You don't have to go all the way to 10,001 step. Now, one question you might ask me is, what does the intermediate value of xk mean? Okay, what is this, what is xk plus one trying to do? So, the question is, what property does xk satisfy okay so let's do uh, let's try to solve or think about this problem imagine this problem in two dimension which will hopefully build some intuition okay this is your let's say this is your x star this is your x1 and this is your D1, direction D1, okay? And when you pick your value of alpha one, you're essentially trying to minimize the function on this particular hyperplane in R2. Actually, this is a line, so it, it's, it's a line in R2, right? And you're trying to minimize the function on this particular line, okay? And you probably got the value of, let's say this is your x2, and this would be your direction d2. So in the first step, you are trying to minimize this function by picking an appropriate value of alpha, you're trying to minimize this function along this line in the second step, you pick a Q conjugate vector D2, which is Q conjugate with respect to D1, and then you start minimizing the function along this line. Professor? Yeah. X1 is closer to X star in that drawing than X2 is. Yes. Uh, well, I don't really know whether X2 will be here or here, so it depends on what the value of D2 is, right? 
But uh, didn't we previously say that at each iteration would get you closer so we can say it would be the higher version? Uh, yes, I did say that. So I'm just bad at drawing pictures. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just put those subscripts on the screen. Right. <laughs> So it's just, uh, it's just because the way I draw it, but uh, I think book has some pictures which will make that concept clearer. So I'll, I'll go over it uh, from different perspectives, okay? So in the second step, you're trying to minimize the function along this line, and then you are guaranteed to get at x star after two time steps. So this is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is you look at the, uh, ISO cost curve, so your ISO cost curve would look something like this. Uh, this is your X star. You are standing here, this is your X1. And let's say this is your V1. And so what you are going to do is you will Again, pick a value of alpha that minimizes the function along this particular line, right? And this would be the minimum point, so this will be your x, x2. And then your next Q conjugate direction would be something like this. And you are trying to minimize the function along this line, and this would be your x3, which is actually your x star. Okay, so this is another way of looking at it. And th in this case, you see that as you run your iteration, you get closer and closer to x star. So this leads us to a property of this xk. So what we can show, in fact, is So I'm going to define mk as the set of all x1 plus beta1 d1 plus beta2 d2 plus beta k dk. Beta1 to beta k in R. Okay, so what does MK look like? So I'm going to draw a three-dimensional hyperplane now. This is your X1, X2, X3. Uh, I, sorry, this is not, I, I meant uh, the first component of X1. So it, you might get confused with this X1. So let me write it as E1 e2 and e3 which are the three dimensions three components of this vector x so your mk is actually this hyperplane and x1 sits somewhere in this hyperplane so this is your mk and the fact is well so this is your mk so the fact is xk plus 1 is argument of f of x where x is in mk. Yes. Xk plus alpha kdk. With alpha k chosen so that the function is minimized? Yes. And so that's why we say that it's the minimum of that. Right. So that's why it's the minimum of the function restricted to this particular hyperplane. Okay. Now, someone asked me this question. So this is a constraint minimization problem. Okay. 
because you're not looking at the whole space, you're constraining yourself to a hyperplane within the entire R3. So that's why this is a constraint minimization problem. And so what you're doing is you have this unconstrained problem and you're solving a series of constraint minimization problem that gets you closer and closer to the optimal solution. Okay? And at every point of time, you add another dimension to this particular hyperplane. So initially, you look at the optimal solution along a line, so that's your x2. Then you increase the dimension and you look at an optimal solution on a plane, so that's x3. And then you again add another dimension to the initial two vectors and you look at an optimal solution to this three-dimensional plane and so on and so forth, okay? And that's what this algorithm is trying to do. And at each step, if you go according to this uh, uh, iteration, then you are always minimizing the function over this larger and larger hyperplane. So uh, the way we've got it set up, the set of D and the common space of Q and we use that to you know, iteratively move closer or along on those vectors until we actually hit that point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So once you keep expanding your space at one point of time, which is Xn plus one, you are essentially looking at the entire space, um, Rn at that moment. Okay, so that's the, so how do we prove this result? So let's try to prove this result. So I can rewrite this particular expression as xk plus one is argmin of beta one all the way up to beta k f of x one plus beta one d one plus beta k d k. Okay. And we have picked the value of beta one, beta two, all the way up to beta k. If, if you're running this iteration, then all these values are actually equal to alpha one to alpha k. Okay, and if I want to prove this result, now this is an unconstrained minimization problem, right? This is an RK. These two problems are equivalent. This is a constrained problem. This becomes an unconstrained problem where I'm looking at argmin of uh, this function over beta one to beta k in RK. And what I'm claiming is if beta one equals to alpha one, beta k equals alpha k, then uh, the argmin is achieved. So then f of um, xk plus one is the min of f of x one plus beta one x one plus sorry beta one d one plus beta k d k. Okay, so what I'm saying is that the optimal solution is actually alpha one all the way up to alpha k. That's what we need to show. So how do we show it? Well, again, this is an unconstrained minimization problem and it's convex in beta one all the way up to beta k. Therefore, I need to show that del f over del beta i at beta i equals alpha i is actually equal to zero. This is what I need to show. Okay, I'll let you guys ponder over this uh, train of thought. Yes. Could we use the fact that uh, we showed uh, the function was convex for alpha and we know it's convex for x Mm -hmm. to know that there's the one unique solution and uh, if we got to that 
one unique solution using the alphas if we're minimizing it using and the, the betas, we're going to get the same result and use that to uh, prove yes more yes uh, yes that's what we are trying to do but we are just making it more rigorous okay okay uh, what you are saying is an intuition but it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really follow directly so you want to spend some time making sure that what your intuition is is indeed correct and uh, there is no so then why is the uh, uh, the del f uh, at, at uh, bi bi equals alpha i equaling zero sufficient to show that's because you are taking the first derivative. Well, this is actually beta i. Well, let me write it as beta k equals not beta k. Beta j equals alpha j for all j. OK? The reason why I'm writing it this way is because this is the first order necessary conditions for optimality for minimizing this particular function, which is a function of beta 1 all the way up to beta k. <coughs> so if it's convex when you have that yes have yes okay. yes so let's try to find out this ex whether this expression holds or not So from this expression, I get that dk transpose gradient of f xk plus alpha k dk is equal to 0. Why? Because alpha k minimizes this minimum. So that's the first derivative of the function at alpha. That's this expression evaluated at alpha k. So that's my equation 1. Uh, actually, this should be true for all i. So this is not necessarily true only for the kth position. This is actually true for all i. For all i in 1, 2, k. So that's number one. That's equation number one. Now I want to compute gradient of f at xk plus 1 transpose di. So this is q xk plus 1 minus b transpose di. And this is equal to Q X I plus one plus alpha I plus two X I plus two alpha k dk minus b transpose di. Oh, yes, absolutely. <coughs> di plus 2. saying that we started at xi plus 1. Yes. And then we pick a direction, we pick the i plus 2 direction and moved along that direction mm -hmm. alpha i plus 2, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so on down. So actually, uh, 
x i plus 1 plus alpha i plus 1 d i plus 1. So this should be alpha i plus 1 d i plus 1 and then so on. Yes, so you are standing at x i plus 1, you pick the direction d i plus 1, you move this step and then so on, all the way up to kth time step. Now, let me break it into two e expressions, x i plus 1 minus b transpose d i plus summation j equals i plus 1 to k alpha j dj transpose q di. Okay, which is equal to zero. Why? So this term is exactly equal to this, and this term is equal to zero because di and dj are q conjugate. So what I have is gradient of f at x k plus one transpose di is equal to zero. And this expression is exactly equal to this expression. Okay, and so that's what the the proof is, which essentially says that x k plus one is argmin x in m k f of x. Any question? Yes? Did we get uh, x of k or uh, x of k plus 1 becomes that sequence because of the uh, whatever that is x? Because of this expression. How does that make a sequence of like x of on plus 1 plus alpha? How does that So, happen? okay, that's a good question. So let me so I have x2, so x1 is picked arbitrarily, so x2 equals x1 plus alpha 1 d1 and then x3 equals x2 plus alpha 2 d2 which is equal to x1 plus alpha 1 d1 plus alpha 2 d2, right? And you can keep going on and what you have is xk equals x1 plus alpha 1 d1 plus alpha k dk or let me write, write it as alpha i plus 1 di plus 1 no alpha i di plus alpha k dk right and this is exactly equal to x i plus 1. Okay, so that's that's exactly the expression I'm using right here. Yes. And how did we loop back from um, showing that the statement over there equaling zero implies as uh, that? So, so this this derivative mm -hmm. is exactly this. Okay. Okay. So if you take the derivative of f with respect to beta i, where beta j is equal to alpha j is the same as gradient of f at x k plus 1 transpose d i. Okay. okay. These are the same expression. Where is the k getting introduced into that equality? Where? This alpha j? No, no, no. the next line down where we're saying that's equivalent to the k plus 1, where is the k coming from in, in those terms? Oh, because you have picked beta j equals alpha j, for all values of j, so that's exactly this expression.
okay okay so the idea is uh, I mean now we know that uh, each of these x x i is we find are actually minimization of the function over a manifold okay what is a manifold well manifold is a surface it could be a curved surface it could be a straight surface it could be whatever right weird surface like a donut okay so what you are doing here is you are expanding the dimension of the manifold one by one at every iteration you are expanding the dimension of the manifold and you are trying to optimize the function over that manifold and in the and after a sufficient number of iteration you have actually encompassed the whole space so your manifold has expanded so much that you pretty much encompass the whole space and that's why you get closer and closer to the optimal solution and eventually you get to the optimal solution using this algorithm the benefit is you can solve problems like this with very high dimensions very quickly okay and i will ask you to implement this in uh, i have asked you to implement this algorithm uh, on matlab for a queue that is a thousand cross thousand matrix right but once you write the code you can run it for 10000 cross 10000 matrix you can try to find the same you can try to solve the same problem with inverting the queue and then multiplying it by b and doing tick tock in matlab which tells you exactly how much time it took to do the computation and then you can run this algorithm and see how much time it took to do this computation and then you can play with it okay if you like optimization you can play with the code and uh, you will realize that this algorithm is much faster than the inverting the queue and multiplying it by b uh, algorithm because that takes a lot more time when q is very high dimensional when not q but x is very high dimensional okay but what i want to take away what i want you guys to take away from this particular algorithm is if you sometimes sometimes you might have to solve a problem in a very high dimensional space how should you go about it well try to solve it in a lower dimensional space and then keep expanding the dimension one by one and you will get to the optimal solution hopefully uh, very quickly in comparison to trying to solve the problem in this higher dimensional space directly any question yes Uh, you know all the all these expressions require that DJs are Q conjugate, right? So let's say if DJ is not exactly Q conjugate, they have some misalignment or whatever, then this will not be exactly zero. This will be close to zero. So I can't say for sure, certain because I haven't thought about it, but it seems like you are essentially trying to do the approximate minimization. You're trying to do the approximate minimization if your Ds are not Q conjugate. Okay, if you still Im apply this algorithm, you're doing approximate minimization, not exact. Okay. That's a very good thought, yeah. So we're, this whole process is kind of presupposed on the idea that we know Q and B, how do we how, what is this particular cost function useful for and how do we set Q into it? So how do we actually set up the problem before we go about applying this algorithm? Okay, uh, that's another good question. So let me uh, try to give you one motivation for this problem. So that's linear regression. Okay, so I'm going to erase this part. Let's say you are a large company, uh, you have millions of customers, and they buy thousands of items on your website, and you have to, and so you, what you do is you create a, uh, you have data, x, not x, I want to give the data a different name. Uh, let's say q1 q2 
q3 q 10 raised to 6 okay so that's your data for 1 million customers uh, it could be their purchase history written in a vector form or it could be how many items they have bought in the past two years in a vector form right and and you want and so you have another vector z1 all the way up to z10 raised to 6 and you hypothesize so these are scalar each of these z is scalar and these are all vector and then you hypothesize that z1 is actually q1 transpose x okay so le let me let me give you a more concrete example let's say you are uh, a real estate company and you want to determine or, or you know the prices of the house based on how many rooms it has how many bathrooms it has what's the area of the house what is what's the quality of the construction between 0 and 1 and so on okay so you suggest that look I think that the price of a house is a linear combination of all these different numbers okay so then what you mean is z1 is actually q1 transpose x z2 is q2 transpose x and so on z10 raised to 6 is q10 raised to 6 transpose x now we don't know what x is that's what you want to find out because then you can predict the price of the house in your area okay so somehow you want to find the value of x how would you find the value of x so you set up a regression problem let me call this matrix as give me a name u so you want z equals to ux you want to find the value of x so you set it up as an optimization problem where you want to solve z minus u of x to norm square minimize with respect to x in rn rn okay uh, so that's this is exactly equal to z minus ux transpose z minus ux and that's uh, z transpose z plus x transpose u transpose ux minus 2z transpose ux okay so this doesn't depend on x so if I want to minimize a function and you have some additive term that doesn't depend on x you can erase that part and then this is your matrix Q here and this is your matrix B transpose here okay so that's a concrete application where vector? sorry isn't B supposed to be a vector yes so Z transpose U is a vector okay you just said it was a matrix oh U is a matrix and Z transpose U would be a vector okay so that's that's one application of this particular conjugate direction now of course in the case of a house the number of features so the dimension of q1 is going to be 5 or 10 or 15 or maybe 100 uh, so that's not a whole lot but uh, I think in larger companies bigger companies where they have very sophisticated uh, data about their consumers about their customers they might be running this algorithm for many many large uh, feature vector so these are called feature vectors any further question yeah um, if x k plus 1 is the uh, is argument of x of uh, x1 plus yes uh, beta 1 yes one, yes um, is there a 
correlation between um, the amount of iteration that needs to be done and the size of the x k for uh, f because. So all we know is n plus 1 iteration will get you to the optimal solution. But we can't say much about the intermediate values of x uh, because it all depends on where you picked x1 and what's the dimension uh, d. Uh, so what are the directions d that you are considering? Okay. So, so to give you an example, let's say by some stroke of luck, this is your x1, and this is your x star, and this is your d1. You have to be very lucky to have this situation, but let's say this is the situation. Within the first iteration, you are at the optimal solution. right? Now, of course, you wouldn't know. In reality, you wouldn't know whether you are at the optimal solution or not. So you will go through finding alpha 2, and that will be 0. And then you will look, at, look for alpha 3, and that will be 0. And you look for alpha 4, and that will be 0, and so on. right? So you wouldn't know. Maybe alpha 50 is going to be non-zero. So then you know that, OK, there is some direction in which you need to descend. But are these d1 to dn uh, necessarily orthogonal to each other? They are q conjugate, so not orthogonal. Okay. Okay. If q was identity, then they are orthogonal. But if Q is not identity, then they are not orthogonal. OK. And that, so we keep saying that the n plus 1, the n plus first iteration is the one that gets us the optimal solution. Yes. And is the dimensionality of the input space, right? Mm -hmm. Right. OK. So I have a, a few minutes. So what I'm going to do is uh, motivate the discussion for the next class. So in the next class, we are going to talk about quasi-Newton methods. The idea is, OK, so we are, we'll not be talking about conjugate gradient. So what's quasi-Newton method? So I want to find dk which is an approximation to second derivative of f at xk inverse. OK? So Newton's method says, well, dk has to be exactly equal to the second derivative f inverse. But computing the second derivative of f and then inverting it is a very computationally intensive uh, approach. So we want to come up with a simplification without really compromising on, uh, with compromising a little bit on the accuracy of this expression. So that's why you want to compute and approximate. So what we want to study is how to get, how to get dk plus 1 from dk such that dk plus 1 is positive definite. That's one of the requirement. And the second is dk plus 1 is approximately equal to fxk plus 1 inverse. Okay, And this operation, going from dk to dk plus 1, has to be quick. Okay, That's the whole point. It has to be quick. What we need to get is a positive definite matrix. And what we need to have is the dk plus 1 should be approximately equal to the second derivative inverse. And so this obviates the need to compute the second derivative and invert it at every point of time. right? But because this is almost equal, dk plus 1 encodes some amount of the curvature, the, some amount of information about the curvature of the function f. It is much faster in practice. The reason being, it inherits all the properties of Newton's method, which is superlinear convergence and all that. Uh, and it doesn't really take that much time to compute the second derivative inverse in this case, okay, or an approximation to the second derivative inverse. So that's the algorithm we will study in the next class. So thank you guys, and see you on Monday.